So th th this term, um, oh, sorry, so the presentation is how do I know if I'm saved? And the term, the technical term for what we're talking about here is assurance, um, knowing that we're saved. And so the, the big questions I think that we're gonna wanna work through as we're going into a study like this is first of all, can we have assurance? Second of all, is it important to? Um, are there any dangers to assurance? That's another question. Um, and then have you struggled with assurance? Now, I, ha I had more people who RSVP'd, so we have a, a limited uh, pool here of, of people to talk with. Um, at this point, my guests are uh, a skeptic and a Christian. So I suspect that my skeptic probably hasn't struggled with assurance too much, unless that's <laughs> unless he's at one point been part of the faith. Is that ever, were, were you ever a Christian in your background, Aaron? Uh, so I... I went to a, uh, so my, my family's pretty secular. Like my, my mom is, she, she claims she's not religious, she's spiritual. And by that, she's in all the new age stuff. My dad claims that, um, well, according to him, he's a Buddhist. Um, they, when I was a kid, they sent me to St. Bernadette Catholic School because... A, it was, they thought I would get the best secular education there, uh, better than the, the local public school. And they did want me to have like some exposure to religion. And so like I went there from kindergarten to the eighth grade. So I've, I, I do know a lot about Catholicism, although I was never baptized nor confirmed or anything like that. And then uh, in high school, I went to Bethel Tate High School where I learned... Uh, where I met all the real Christians, real in quotation marks. It's not meant to be disparaging or anything, but yeah, that's, that's where I met like the uh, the fundamentalist contingent and all that stuff. And you know, I, I came out of Saint Bernadette calling myself a Christian, and then I got faced with uh, with my classmates at the public school said things like. Uh, Aaron, do you believe in uh, the Big Bang? Yes. Uh, so you're not a Christian? Guess not, then. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and, and it's just, you know, I, I certainly appreciate the, uh, you know, the teachings of Christ, especially those of of selflessness and and uh, trying to do the best for people around you and uh, try to do the best for yourself, to, to make yourself the best person that you can possibly be. And so like, you know, those are values that I apply in my own life and whether or not I call myself a Christian, I don't know. <laughs> I just try to be a decent person. But, th but this question of salvation wouldn't be particularly meaningful to you though, from where you're standing, right? Well, so I definitely had my own supernatural beliefs. Like I, I definitely went heavily into the, the new age stuff coming out of high school and, uh, you know, believed in things like uh, 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 body, spirit, duality, and life after death, reincarnation even and stuff. But I, I and I certainly, you know, I hope all that stuff is true like i think it would be amazing if my like my uh my grandfather uh grandpa ivan who died when i was 17 i would love to to know that he's out there somewhere watching me go on to like become a physicist and all this stuff because he was a big influence in why i went that direction that would be amazing if it was true but you know, I ultimately I have the the way I choose to live my life is like, well, I'm not going to assume that any of that's true. I'm just, I don't know, and I'm comfortable not knowing. And uh, you know, if all that stuff is true, fantastic. If it's not, then well, I'm just going to make the most out of what I got. So uh, whether or not I'm saved, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going to do the best I can while I'm here. And uh, if this is it, then when I'm dead, I'm not going to care anymore because I won't be around. Sure. As, 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 well, that's uh, one part of the, um, uh, oh, shoot, what's the, uh, what's the dilemma? The, um, the, the, math, the Pascal's wager. The oh, yeah. Pascal's wager. Yeah. It's, uh, 
err on the side that God exists. <laughs> just to be safe. Yeah, just to be safe. Yeah. I think he was considering, though, like he was, uh, like you, you know more about this than I do, undoubtedly, but my impression is he believed in like eternal damnation and stuff. And so sure. like the idea was you better err on the side of caution in case all that's real. Yeah, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what Pascal meant and then how we apply it today. You know, can we advance that argument to something more sophisticated or not? And I, which I think we should, but yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but, but once we move past that question of, um, is it in your best interest to do it? <laughs> or, do you, or do you have any, re you know, I think we, these questions of, um, do we have reasons to believe it is another question. But what we're kind of, I guess, more focusing on is, uh, let's say even you do believe it, but emotionally you don't know, or, or intellectually maybe you struggle to know if you're, uh, if you're good, so to speak. Um, I think is something that a lot of people who are Christians will really struggle with, you know, do, uh, you know, where am I going when I die and that kind of thing. So maybe moving on to Daniel and Chuck, if, if I saw Chuck has joined in, I, I don't see his screen there, so I, I'm not sure if he's hearing me, but um, I'd be interested to hear if Daniel or Chuck have, have struggled with uh, assurance. Um, I'm hearing you. Okay, great. Well, well do you want to start, Chuck? Yeah, so um, for me, where I gained full assurance is after studying some of the different religions and understanding that, you know, Christian, our Christian religion is based on Jesus being resurrected. And that's been proven that he resurrected. Um, you know, you can, you can read through, you know, documentation. And so by knowing that Christ rose and was resurrected and went to heaven, and I believe that in full faith, I have full assurance that I'm saved. And I don't waver at all. That's okay. personally how I feel um, because, of, because of that. And there's no other religion that had a person that came in that said he was God, which is Christ, and, uh, and had the person that was leading the religion actually rise from the dead and be lifted up to heaven. No other religion I know of can say that. Um, so I feel very strong and confident in myself, my so, so I think from where you're coming from, we'll get into this a little bit, there's kind of what's called the objective and the subjective. So objectively, someone might say, well, Jesus has died for my sins, and so that's, that's the reality up here. But I think what some people will struggle with is they may acknowledge that or believe that, but there may be this question of, okay, but how do I know that I personally am saved? You know, just because Jesus died for sinners, does that mean that I'm one of them or that, um, you know, that, that, that I, I can have confidence that, that I've been redeemed? I think that can be that can be a struggle for some people. Right, I but, understand that. But not you so much. Yeah, thanks. That's good to hear. Awesome. Well, and uh, Daniel, your background was I think you had a deconversion. You were maybe you grew up Christian and then deconverted and came back. Is that correct? Or? Not quite. I grew up secular scientist, became a Christian. After ten years, I went through a deconversion. Not, I wouldn't call it deconversion. I'd call, what do they call it these days? Uh, deconstruction. Ah. And I, I basically did leave the faith, and after eight years, I, I came back. Uh, but for me, assurance is, um, you know, I had a real uh, powerful conversion experience. So for me, there was no question about whether I was a Christian. The, the question for me, being in a, a charismatic Arminian context, was how, how, how hard did I have to work to keep it and to maintain my sanctification and salvation through effort? you know, as part of a holiness movement. And that nearly killed me until I discovered Calvinism uh, through both scripture and books. And then that gave me a type of assurance for keeping me in the faith that I did not have previously. Now, now I've kind of backtracked. I'm a Calvinist leaning Molinist. We don't, we don't have to talk about that now, but it just means that I do have a uh, significant responsibility, but not compared to God's ability to keep me. Uh, so my faith's kind of in a different place now. If I can't do it, still doesn't matter because he can do it. So I, I think that's, that was quite a wake up call for me. And that's my assurance journey in a nutshell. I think the, the Calvinism question is significant. Um, so for, for those who are kind of unfamiliar, um, Calvinism is this, um, so whereas Catholic, the Catholic church has tended toward a belief in free will with maybe some exceptions. Um, the most of the early Protestants, apart from like Anabaptists, um, took this notion of determinism pretty seriously. Um, uh, Luther had this book, The Bondage of the Will. And his idea was that 
there was nothing that we could do to earn our salvation. Um, and in fact, we were, and, and Calvin kind of refines this, but um, that we're in bondage to sin and can't cho choose for ourselves to be saved. So we have to rely on God to do that. Now, Arminians, uh, Arminius is this guy who comes a little bit later, who's in that sort of reformed Protestant tradition, but he pushes back on this notion of determinism and emphasizes free will and the ability to choose. Um, now, they, he would say that that's, that's a gift from the Holy Spirit. God gives you the ability to do so. Uh, it's not something you do completely on your own, but everybody has that opportunity. But it seems that it, when you look at that, their, their assurance can, can hit you on both sides, though, because it seems to me from an Arminian perspective, believing that you have some, um, some say in, in, in whether or not you're saved can make you really anxious, right? Especially if you have a, a type of personality where you worry about if you're doing enough or you, you question, you, just, you know, you're just a nervous personality type. Um, but on the other hand, it seems that if you're a Calvinist, and I've heard some Calvinists talk about this struggle, okay, yes, I, I know that whoever God has chosen to save will be saved, but what if I'm, um, what if I'm not one of the elect and I just think that I am? Because from a Calvinist perspective, there are people who will believe they're saved and fall away, and the Calvinists would say, well, they were never actually saved then, because if they were, they would have persevered. Which so, I think is a, uh, not a great conclusion, but it stems directly from their doctrine. So they, they're kind of unavoidably pushed to that conclusion, that the person was never a Christian anyway, and I, I, I think that's uh, possibly er erroneous. And, well, but also, I wanted to distinguish between assurance of salvation and uh, like initial, like, do I know, how do I know if I'm a Christian at all? Mm -hmm. And how do I know that I'm going to make it to the end without falling away, without doing something totally stupid? And that's where Calvinism was very useful to me because it didn't just say he chose me, but then he would complete the work regardless yeah. of my ability or character. Yes, I have responsibility, but maybe I shouldn't rely on that too much because my own ability is pretty limited well from, from a Calvinist perspective though um i mean perseverance like you said it seems to follow so wouldn't that mean that if, if you fall fell away that you you weren't saved i think you would be forced to that conclusion from that assumption but i don't agree with that initial assumption i think is where that's why i'm not a full-on calvinist but a, gotcha. a molinist yeah okay all right well that's that's a fascinating philosophical discussion i'd love to tease out a little bit more but it might be a little off topic to go too far in that direction <laughs> Um, well, so I guess I, that may, maybe the, the, this question about the dangers of assurance, we'll get to that uh, maybe as we talk, so maybe I'll just move forward um, and we can discuss that when we get there. Uh, the next thing I guess I'd like to do um, is talk about how Christians in the past have struggled with this, and I don't go back too far. Um, I go back to uh, the way Luther and the Catholic uh, Church and the Council of Trent uh, talked about this, and I sort of move forward. Um, I would be interested in doing a a study a little bit further back, but it seems that this question really becomes a major question with the Protestant Reformation, and maybe before that, it's not quite as uh, quite as much on the on the scene. So we'll move on to there. So assurance perspectives through the centuries, <laughs> the Roman Catholic position. Yeah, that's a lot to read, isn't it? So I'll, I'll, I wanted to keep the full quotes here. So the Roman Catholic position is uh, exemplified in the Council of Trent. And this is a reaction to Luther. They say, no one can know with the certainty of faith, which excludes the possibility of error, that he continues in the grace of God. If any man hold trust, confidence, or assurance of pardon to be essential to the faith, to faith, which Luther did, let him be accursed. So assurance leads, in their view, to false confidence and lack of interest in good works. And from their perspective, you know, you, you, you can't know without the possibility of error, which I actually think there's some validity to that. People could certainly think that they're saved and they're not. Um, but they're reacting specifically to, to what Luther said. Um, and I quote Luther here as an example. If we doubt God's grace and do not believe that God is well pleased in us for Christ's sake, then we are denying that Christ has redeemed us. Indeed, we question outright all his benefits. So Luther, I think, is leaning on this more objective viewpoint that we talked about that Christ has done this, that's it. You know, if, if you really have faith in God, you're going to have faith that God's done this. And so, so for him, it's kind of a package deal, not just salvation, but assurance with it. Um, so yeah, for, yeah, his perspective, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. And that means God saved us. We shouldn't doubt it. 
Now, Calvin comes a little bit later than Luther. So, so far we're reading uh, guys from the, the 16th century, and Calvin's uh, still in there a little bit, moves into the next century, I think. But he writes that uh, knowledge of salvation is, quote, founded on the truth of the gratuitous promise in Christ, is revealed to our minds and confirmed to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So he starts with the objective reality of what God's done, and then he moves to this subjective feeling of being a child of God, which is often called in theological circles, the witness of the Spirit. So we start with the truth as it exists, and we move forward to what we know in our minds and what we feel in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit witnesses those things to us. Jonathan Edwards, he's actually, uh, wait, is Jonathan Edwards American, Daniel? I'm pretty sure he is. Yes. Jonathan Edwards is Puritan, American Puritan, or at least within that sort of vein. Uh, and he writes that a holy life is the chief of all the signs of grace, both as an evidence of the sincerity of professors unto others and also to their own consciences. And quote, in other words, good works are the ground of our assurance, not necessarily the object of reality, not necessarily our feelings, but whether or not we're doing good works. John Wesley comes, uh, he's, writing uh, end, of the, end of the 18th century. He's this major uh, figure who's one of the co-founders of the Methodist Church. And he writes that the testimony of our own spirit, sorry, or conscience, that we walk in simplicity and godly sincerity. Secondly, and chiefly, the testimony of the spirit of God bearing witness with or to our spirit that we are the children of God. So he's building on this Romans 8.16 idea of the, the spirit witnessing to our spirit. And he argues that assurance is broadly experiential. Um, he sees it primarily as this witness of the spirit thing. Um, unfortunately for Wesley, uh, Wesley's experience was not always as a confident Christian. He really struggled. He was emotionally kind of all over the place. And even after he makes a firm commitment to the faith, he's constantly wavering about whether he's saved. And so unfortunately, unfortunately for him, he settled on this experiential notion uh, because his experience was not very reliable <laughs> for him on that subject. Um, excuse me. Now we move into more modern era here, and we've got a guy like Charles Stanley, who's um, a preacher. I think he's still a radio preacher today. I don't listen to Christian radio much anymore, but I think he is. And he holds this view of eternal security. He says, even if a believer for all practical purposes becomes an unbeliever, his salvation is not in jeopardy. Believers who lose or abandon their faith will retain their salvation. This concept of eternal security or once saved, always saved holds that once you have made a confession of faith, you are saved and can never be lost again. So folks like this are, are all about trying to get a quick confession out of somebody, and then they feel that they've done their work. They can, they can leave, and that's it. <laughs> now, Cody, I, I have to disagree with you a little oh, bit on that. Go ahead. I mean, I, I love Charles Stanley, but um, I think what he's saying, I mean, one of the – in reality, in many, of course, Baptist churches, and Charlie Stanley's, Stanley's Baptist, you're right. Someone who makes a confession of faith thinks, well, I did what I was supposed to do. It's like getting confirmed in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. You went through the ritual, and you feel like that's it. Without it. But if they truly did have a change of heart, I think no matter where the, you know, the vagaries of life take them, I would think I would agree with him that they haven't lost their faith. In fact, it's, I think it's possible, but unlikely, is the way I look at it as a Calvinist leaning Molinist that, um, you know, when I left the faith for eight years, was I still a Christian? It, am I only a Christian because I came back? Um, and again, we're dealing with a mystery here, but I do think there is something to this idea that if our faith is in God's ability to save us and to keep us, that if we don't, well, the question is then what if we don't persevere? What if we become functional unbelievers? Uh, and he's saying, sorry, God is bigger than your functional unbelief. Um, I think that's a legit position you could take. And in my experience, because of my experience, I kind of lean that way, not just because I came back, but it's almost like I don't think I could ever undo the regeneration that happened for real in my life. Uh, even if, even while I was wandering, you know, part of it was my foundation sucked so bad that I had to undo them all to refine it for myself, almost like a teenager building their old identity by, you know, disconnecting from their parents' system of morality. You know, and so I just want to defend this idea that it's not just a superficial, you know, you can walk down the aisle and be saved, although some people interpret it that way, just like a Catholic would say, well, I did all the rituals. Now, it reminds me, can I tell you a joke? 
here's a, sure. it's, a it's a hell joke. So I love uh, those. There's uh, there's three Christians in a car, a charismatic, a Baptist, and a Catholic, and they get in this terrible accident and they die and they all wake up in hell. And they're all they're priests and pastors actually. So they look at each other and they're just in disbelief that they're in hell. And they say to the uh, the Catholic, uh, "Why are you here?" He goes, "Well, I don't know. I, I I was baptized and I was confirmed. I have no idea why I'm here." And they look to the Baptist and they say, "Well, why are you here?" He goes. I don't know. I believe once saved, always saved. I went down for the altar call and they look at the charismatic and he goes, I'm not confessing it, which means uh, I'm not going to agree with the fact that I'm in hell because I'm otherwise, you know, uh, it's a silly joke. But the joke is, is there are a lot of false uh, responses to perhaps good doctrines like eternal security, you know, uh, and, and that is the reality of regeneration is that the, is the baseline for me of, deciding well then what happens afterwards if sure now so if i could push back a little bit i think the difference between um you and stanley is that stanley is not a calvinist so i think when a calvinist says that they believe in eternal security i go okay well sure you know that's fine they believe that those who you know, if, if you're saved you'll persevere to the end and those who persevere are safe so there's still an emphasis on right living and and, and a sincere proclamation of faith that continues um, they just, they just, I just think they put the cart before the horse, you know. Well, they, they are reformed. I mean, isn't that similar? I think Baptists are kind of reformed, aren't they? Most Baptists are not, apart from reformed Baptists. So Stanley, I think, would be, I don't know if he'd call himself an Arminian. He's probably one of those Arminians that don't call themselves an Arminian because they just want to say that if you follow a man, then you're not really following Jesus. Right. But I know, I know Wesleyanism is generally Arminian, but... Uh, Wesleyan is. Most Baptists are as well, though. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That, that's one of the things they claim from the Anabaptists. That and believer's baptism. They don't keep any of the uh, pacifism stuff, obviously. Um, but, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So, that, that's where I would distinguish um, Stanley from what Calvin would say. Because Calvin is saying that there actually is something that continues to the end, where Stanley says, well, uh, well as he says in the quote, you know, even if you become an unbeliever, your salvation is never in jeopardy. And so... I think that's problematic. And I, I understand the concern that um, there are people who say, well, you know, if Jesus has saved us, then what does that mean? Does that mean if I go out and I, and I get angry and I flip somebody off when I'm, you know, driving to work, have I lost my salvation? And, and so I think that this eternal security thing is a way of dealing with that emotional struggle of, you know, have I lost it? Have I, do I have it? Have I lost it? Do I have it? Have I lost it? Um, and so my, my hope is to get to a, a perspective. I think that's, thoroughly biblical that uh, makes perseverance important <laughs> and essential, um, but also uh, doesn't give you really any, any major reasons to question your faith if you're really continuing in the faith. And so, but you see how the, the, this is kind of developing over time um, from kind of a, an objective to a more subjective uh, until you get to Stanley, in which case there's there's not there's nothing about the subjective experience that's really important apart from that initial um, um, uh, pro proclamation of faith. And at that point, you know, it's, it's objective again. God just takes over. Um, okay, so th these are these kind of broad broad strokes to use. But I think the real question is not necessarily whether or not Jesus saved some people, but whether or not Jesus has saved me. Martin Luther's argument is that saving faith includes the belief that God has saved me. But I think that misses the point because many have made a confession of faith but seemed to have no sincerity. As Jesus taught, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. So how can I have confidence that my confession is real, knowing that apparently some people have a false confession who feel very confident that they're saved? Um, and, and I would argue that th there must be some sort of a test, some way to examine ourselves to see if our assurance is well-founded. I think experience is, is probably not that test because it's our experience is always going to be filtered through our feelings and not what God's actually done. So if I have a rosy view on life, I'll probably be more likely to have a false confidence with no real conversion. Uh, but if I'm anxious or self-abasing, I, I might fear that God would never save a person as wicked as me when that's actually exactly what he's done. 
So for, from my perspective, it would be important that we develop a reliable for, means for determining if we're truly saved. And, and now, Daniel, I know that you have a, an article um, about this. And, uh, maybe before I share some of my perspectives on this, I'd be interested in hearing um, how, how you would ground assurance. Well, I, I do agree that, we, that the self-authenticating witness is an important part of how you know you're a Christian. But you're right. It, it is subjective. Um, but I think it's, it's real and important. Um, and I also like your switch of emphasis here because I don't have to prove to you that I'm a Christian by my good works. Don't have to do it. What, what he's really, I think what scriptures ask us to do is examine ourselves. That if you're not really changed, that if, if you're not, um, you know, if good works aren't beginning to come out of your life, if you're not noticing a moral transformation, uh, maybe you're not a Christian. And I think that's important that I'm not here to evaluate anyone else, except there is a case when I get to evaluate others, which is when if they're applying for leadership in the church, right? They have to display certain character levels, virtue, um, which we assume is the result of an inward transformation, uh, like being the husband of one wife or, you know, having a single spouse, for instance, not three or whatever. But um, yeah, so I think that's the first thing I just want to say is that it really is. This question is mostly about self-examination and not evaluating others. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all or any of that. Anyone else wants to talk about that before I say anything else? It, it is interesting. Um, I don't know if Chuck's still with us, but um, my quick thought on that is if you're going to evaluate others, you should at least take seriously what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, which is that the judgment that you made, made out to others is going to be made out to you. <laughs> so if you want to look at somebody and say, well, you're not saved because X, Y, Z, you might want to be very careful to reflect on your own life experience and see whether or not you have ever done X, Y, Z or anything in that vein. <laughs> uh, because, you know, God, Jesus promises that that same standard will be met out to you. So I think that's really- I, I agree with that too. What's that, Chuck? I also agree with that uh, statement, Cody, yeah. that uh, I'm, I don't judge other people and, and their salvation. Um, I can- teach and I can disciple and we can learn together and share in the spirit together and, and grow. And that, that will help, you know? Yeah. So you... I, I didn't want it to go without saying that whenever the topic of how do you know you're saved comes up, I think a lot of us think, Oh, now you're judging me. If, oh, whether or not I'm a true Christian, is this like the no true Scotsman fallacy, you know, that you decide who, who is and who isn't. And really that's, I don't think that's the, what we're talking about, but I think that, misunderstanding could arise yeah no that, that, that's really I, I think i've um the, the longer i go i think the, the, the more um uncomfortable i am with making judgments about who's in and who's out <laughs> um i mean e even on something like an issue that's easy, like important issues like of orthodoxy you know like things that i think are essential to calling a belief a christian belief I, I'm going to want to be careful about reflecting on, you know, well, this person's not really saved because they believe the wrong thing about this or that. Even if it's an essential belief, I think, I mean, I think we should combat those bad, <laughs> bad, bad views. But um, I, I, I presume that I probably have some things wrong too, and, and maybe something, some, some significant things. And I want to be careful about issuing out judgments that could be used against me. Um, so I think it's really, it, it, like you said, it's not about how do I know you're saved? Um, you know, I could have my speculation <laughs> on, on that, but ultimately I don't know. And it's not for me to decide. Aaron, do you have an opinion on this topic at all about judging others or self-evaluation, you know, stuff like that in light of your experience versus objective? I don't know, something. Well, I was going to throw out there that I'm a huge fan of self-evaluation. And um, I mean, basically you guys already said the things that I was gonna not say, but cheer on in a way, like uh, evaluate yourself before you evaluate others, that kind of thing. Um, Cody, you mentioned that uh, the the Sermon on the Mount there, and I'm thinking, yeah, right on. <laughs> like Any standard that you apply to others, apply it to yourself first, make sure that you are living up to that standard. Um, that's about it. All right, well, Cody, let me close out what you asked me. And that is because I wrote an article out of my website. I guess you can post the link later or whatever. 
But I'm realizing now that we're discussing that most of the things I mentioned are the subjective side of the equation. And I think it's important here that you are talking about the objective side, especially if subjectively you're prone to self doubt and, you know, and, uh, um, you know, but so I had listed things like the Bible becomes alive to you. You know, you're, you've had a transformation. If suddenly there's a big change in how the Bible begins to speak to you on a deep convictional level, uh, that you have a desire to please God. You know, a lot of people ask the question of, you know, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Have I lost my salvation by doing something? And I always tell them, look, if you still have a desire to please God, you're doing good. Uh, you haven't, you know, and and along with that comes a, a distaste for sin. But the problem with that is, of course, we're people in transformation. So there's still some sins that maybe I have not abandoned. Uh, and so I'm not saying that you have to know you're perfect, but if you do have a, a, a sincere conflict over some of the things that you know are not good in your life that the scripture says you shouldn't do, I think that those are all evidences, subjective evidences that uh, you are a Christian because the spirit of God is in your life teaching you through the scriptures, you know, drawing you to God and you and a, giving you a desire to please God. And you have this conflict over the deeper attitudes and practices of your heart. So along with the self-authenticating witness that we talked about, I think all those subjective things are important, but we may need to put an objective framework in place to support that. Because again, we can all say, how do I no, I'm just not talking to myself here. Or how do I know, you know, that, that all of this, any of the subjective experience is real. So I do think it's important to ground it, which is, it looks like where you're kind of going, but maybe I'm saying too much here. Well, and, and, yeah, that, that, that's all right. I, one thing I want to say um, that I don't think I have in my notes about objectivity here um, is that if you see God as, as constantly waiting for you to trip up so he can punish you, um, it's going to have an impact on how you see your security, um, your assurance. And um, I, I've been very fascinated by a passage in Exodus that gets quoted all throughout the Old Testament and, and maybe even referenced a little bit in the New or uh, alluded to, which uh, there's this analogy that's used where it says that, that God um, shows wrath to the third and fourth generation uh, or v visit sin to the third and fourth generation, but he's merciful to the thousands of generations. And so the point is, as you know, three and four in comparison to thousand or thousands, <laughs> um, this is God's wrath, this is God's mercy. Um, and so I think it's, it's important to remember that, um, you know, just because they're, you believe in a God who is going to judge, um, that doesn't mean you have to think of him as constantly waiting for you to trip up to try to find some excuse to, to throw you in the hellfire or something like that. That's, that's not what we're talking about. And so that objective thing is, is something that's important to remember too, what kind of God we're talking about. Right. And I think that's, what's important is the context or the framework of, of theology around your belief system is going to affect your assurance. I think is my recap of that. Yeah. Good. So I will at this point give some of my um, my conclusions about how maybe we should be looking at this question: um, how to know if you're saved. This is the this is the definitive. Def <laughs> no, this is my opinion after after looking at it a little bit. So, yeah. So I'm going to say the Spirit does witness to our spirit, but one way He does this is through Scripture. Uh, so so I think we can trust the promises in Scripture. For instance, that. Righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Um, the Spirit says to our spirit that we should trust that God wants to save anyone who comes to him in faith. Uh, this may have an experiential emotional component, but it might not, or it may not all the time. Um, so I think expecting it to be, you know, waiting around for the experience, um, I think is, is not the, the best way to determine if you're saved. Um, I think you're going to get some experiences. Um, some sometimes they're going to be more extreme than others, but um, I don't think that's going to be the major test. I think the major test is the spirit is witnessing to our spirit. Spirit, but but one of the ways he does that is through scripture. So what does scripture say? Uh, from a Christian perspective, that's going to be significant. Uh, and since we can believe in an intellectual sense only and not truly dedicate ourselves to the way of Jesus, we should also check to see if we have repented of our sin. After all, the command of Jesus is to repent and believe. We do so by checking our fruits. If we are Christian trees, so to speak, we should be producing Christian fruits. 
Some of us may be producing more fruit more rapidly, <laughs> but those who are sincerely in the faith will have turned away from a life of sin and sought to live differently, even if imperfectly. If we find that there is no evidence in our hearts or actions to suggest that we're in the faith, uh, this can and should be resolved immediately. Repent and believe, knowing that salvation comes to all who truly turn to Christ as their Savior. So I, I, I would argue that the subject of, has a, a component here, but I, I would not want to make that the most significant part. I would say um, it's an input-output thing. W what do you believe about the input? Do you believe that you have a, a, a holy and good, merciful God who wants to save you and has made a way to do so? And do you see evidence in your life that he's done so? Now, again, I would caution people on evidence because just doing good works is not evidence. Sure. Uh, in fact, our temptation as humans is to actually do that and step off of a foundation of grace and shift into works like they did in the Galatians, you know, and where Paul addresses this in Galatians. So I would be careful because there are a lot of areas in my life that are still not renewed, so to speak. But God, I don't feel like God's working on them. If I tried to do everything that Christians and pastors told me to do, I'd be really, really busy and really, really frustrated. And so I've, over time, I've come to not make excuses for my lack of charity in certain areas, but, to, but only responding to conviction. As long as I stay in, I guess like what I'm saying is as long as I, the thing I'm, not, the thing I'm supposed to do is not just do good works, but stay connected to Christ and the good works that he chooses will come out of those naturally. So uh, not that I don't have choice to like help my neighbor or something or make an effort, but I, I'm really cautious of, of emphasizing personal responsibility and effort because it easily morphs into, um, you know, works that are not something God has asked you to do. And then you end up frustrated in your faith or, you know, or whatever. I, I'm, I'm just, you know what I'm saying here? Uh, I'm just very cautious when I hear, you know, apply yourself. I agree that, but how we apply ourselves is important. And I know that, you know, sometimes you don't just need to pray or study. You do need to go out and serve your neighbor. I'm not saying as a discipline, you know what I mean, uh, to, to gain the right heart. But there's a, there, there's a risk of emphasizing works, which is where I think Arminianism goes off the rails uh, in the holiness movement. It, it could certainly be. Yeah, so um, I, I don't want to disagree with anything you said there. I think there's a danger in looking that, that, that works become – a way to pat yourself on the back if you think you're doing a good job um, or to, to, to find some area where you're uh, where you can improve and look at that as evidence that you are to give you a false assurance that yeah. because I'm doing good things and that's what Jesus's thing was about you know we cast out demons in your name and he says depart from me I never knew you and mm -hmm. that's critical it's I agree with you that good works or fruits of character and kindness and patience are evidence that you're being changed from the inside but um, yeah, just good works in themselves apart from a relationship with God is, um, could be a false hope, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I like the way the, uh, the James says it, um, that, um, our good works justify our confession of faith. Um, Chuck. Yeah. I just wanted to add too that good works also includes just daily, you know, worship and, and connecting with the Lord. Just that, you know, building your faith through, you know, faith only builds through works. And that work starts with, you know, your daily relationship and in intimacy with the Lord. And then through that, that's where the other good things start popping out. I mean, automatically, you know, because you're with the Lord, you know. Yep, absolutely. Well, and, and I think that the, the I, I, it's tough to, know, to, to be able to talk about this in just the right way without going off the rails one way or another, because I think it's, it's, a, it's a narrow corridor that we're having to travel here. Um, but I, what I tried to think say was to repent and believe and know that salvation comes to those who turn to Christ as their savior. So I think that, um, I think the works come in as, as an evidence for sure. Um, they, they justify our confession of faith. Um, but, um, I disagree with, um, um, you know, some of the Wesleyans, for example, that um, that you may have this moment of this sort of second act of grace where you're going to get zapped and then um, that's going to purify your heart and that's going to change. You know, you're, you're not going you're, you're not going to have any sinful motivations or actions from that point onward. I think yeah. that's that's something that they are constantly going to be having to worry about and fight against. But I think that the desire to combat that, the desire to keep coming back to Christ, 
is I think one of the chief evidences. Um, to, to, this idea of repentance is to turn around. It's, it's instead of I'm going to keep going this way, it's I'm going to turn and look at Christ and move in that direction. And, you know, so you, you may drag your feet a little bit. Some people might get there a little bit faster, but that orientation and that movement, yeah. I think, is what's, what's most important. Well, and I'm trying not to belabor this, but I, I once preached a sermon called Stop Working for God. And one of the questions you, as a Christian you can ask yourself, if I stop doing good works, am I still saved? Now, the answer should be yes. <laughs> and if not, then you're really trusting in your works to keep you in, in, in the fold here. Now, you should have good works as an evidence that proves to you that something's really happening. But I think uh, if you're trusting in them, you can answer that question. So if I say, so me, if I stop my good works, no, I'm still saved. Am I still going to do good works? Yeah, because there are things that are happening in my life that give me life that God is, you know, drawing me to do. I like that better. Uh, I see you're hemming and hawing there. Go. <laughs> so I, I might push back a little bit. It, it's, it's almost like an SAT, like kind of if, if then sort of question or whatever. But um, I, so if, if I stop doing good works, am I still saved? I might say no, but not because the good works save you, but because good works follow from a true confession of faith. So it's the true confession of faith that saves you, but that also produces good work. So it's kind of like going out and seeing a fruit tree and saying, I'm not seeing any fruit coming. Does that mean the tree is dead? Well, no, it doesn't mean the tree is dead, but if the tree is alive, it's also going to produce fruit if it's a fruit tree. <laughs> the, right. the, the absence of fruit doesn't make it dead. It's dead because something has happened further down in the roots. Right, but I, yeah, I agree with you. I think we totally agree on this. It's just a fine, fine point, but a lot of church people are, motivated by they have to keep doing good works maybe a few i don't know maybe it's not a lot so i would say if you stopped doing all those things if you stopped volunteering if you stopped doing all the things that you think you're doing for god um would you lose your salvation or not and you know that to me that answers the question uh hmm. because it's not my good works don't save me my good works are just a result or evidence that god is working in my life that's all gotcha feel you I saw Chuck's video pop up for a second, which made me think he was about to say something. Did, did, Chuck, did Chuck have anything to add? I was just going to, I was just um, acknowledging uh, and agreeing with the statement. So, yeah, I agree. Awesome. Well, I don't remember if I don't know that I have anything else to add other than I think that was the end of the slideshow at the very least. Um, so let me stop my screen share um, and jump back here. So, um, I guess what I would ask is that, or do we have any sort of concluding thoughts? And um, I, I think there's, there's kind of some broadly on the same page here. It's a complicated question because I think a lot of these things factor in, you know, the objective reality of what Christ has done, um, our works are, help us answer this question a little bit of how we know we're saved. Um, there's this question of the witness of the spirit, um, which is subjective. And I think that seems to factor in. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of the times we answer the question um, sometimes incorrectly by going too far in one of those directions and not in another. I think Luther, um, by making everything so objective, um, doesn't really have much of a means to test whether or not he's in the faith. You know, well, Jesus saved me, so I don't really need to look at anything else. It's like, well, maybe you do. Maybe, you know, maybe for example, you know, telling, uh, saying that we should go down, burn, burn down the Jews, Jewish synagogues is evidence that there might be a problem that you should examine. Um, <laughs> he said... Yeah, he did. So Luther was inter Luther um, was pro-Jewish for a while, and then I think he had some um, um, efforts to reach out to them that were rebuffed, and so he started to become, in his old age, very impatient with the Jews and said that the best way to deal with them was to uh, burn down their synagogues. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I would see that as an evidence that maybe there was something uh, wrong in Luther's heart that should have been addressed, and maybe his view of assurance uh, stopped him from thoroughly addressing that problem. Or his theology was just you know, half-baked at that point. Yeah. I mean, you got to admit they were coming out of centuries of what I would call bad Catholic theology. And, you know, I mean, even after the Lutherans started their reforms, the Anabaptists had to take it the next step. I feel like even the Lutheran Ref Ref Reformation was incomplete, yeah. uh, doctrinally speaking. And I, who knows what else was going on in his weird head. He was an angry dude, I think, even though he was very influential. And in fact, I was going to say he once said... Uh, love God and sin boldly. And what I like about this is his emphasis on it's not based on your works. You, you have to stop thinking like a Catholic 
that you have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to do nothing to add to your salvation except for believe and sit on that foundation for a good long time before you start any of your works because your works don't save you. They just prove that God's life is in you. And you don't have to prove it to me, but let it prove it to yourself. And I, I, I mean, I kind of err on that side, as you can tell. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, I think Luther's a fascinating historical figure because, I mean, you could argue that we would not have the Protestant Reformation if Luther wasn't struggling with assurance. Because it all begins with, with him, you know, he's this monk who is constantly worried about the hammer of God dropping down on him. Uh, and he's spending hours in confession every day. And it's like, his confessors are like, dude, you're a monk. What could you possibly be doing that warrants you being in confession for hours every day? But he, he had this, this, this great fear um, that he wasn't really saved, that his sin was keeping him from God. And um, I, I love think that led to this notion of assurance. I love what he writes about his conversion, where he's studying in Romans, where it says, and now the righteousness of God is revealed. And he thinks that what that means is that not only are we sinners, but that God reveals how great of a sinner he is, we are, and how righteous he is by sending an innocent man, Christ, to die. And what's being revealed there is how really wicked we are, that we're so wicked that he reveals his righteousness in Christ's selfless death, showing us how selfish and ungodly we are. And all of a sudden he realizes, oh my gosh, the salvation, the righteousness that's being revealed is that that righteousness is freely given to us and it transforms his life from one of works and feeling like a worm um, to, okay, I'm a worm, but this action wasn't to show that God's more righteous than me, but that he's giving me this righteousness freely and that was part of his transformation i it's a very funny story if you read what he wrote writes about it yeah my, my understanding um at least there, there's a, an apocryphal account that uh, he made this discovery in the latrine <laughs> i he wouldn't be just, surprised yeah. uh, no, anyway. that's right that's where i read i mean <laughs> <laughs> i do all my best thinking there um so, <laughs> but uh yeah um yeah, but in my opinion, I, I think Luther seized on a, a real problem that I think the church at the time had not come up with a good solution for, which is, uh, you know, how do I know that I'm saved? If, I, if, I'm, if I'm a sinner <laughs> and I'm constantly screwing up um, and God is supposed to be so good and holy, how can I have any confidence that I've, right. that I've made? And so I think he's addressing a real problem, but I think he, he probably goes too far in the other direction. Um, and so I, hopefully this discussion today has, has opened up some, some uh, questions or, or answers maybe about uh, putting some guardrails around um, either side here to be, to be so scrupulous that you can have no assurance uh, or to be uh, so, uh, to, to sin so boldly because you know that God is, is, is such a wonderful savior. Yeah, and scrupulous is a, is a good word. In fact, I just realized a while back that it's actually kind of a theological word, mostly associated with Catholicism because they have this, this uh, dysfunction, if you will, called scrupulosity, which is you're worried about every single action and every single thought uh, in your life to this, to a type of paranoia that's very unhealthy. And again, I think this comes from misplacing works in our theological equation and fruits and all that. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of Luther on this one, because only because I was also there. And so it's kind of a safe haven to say, oh, thank God my works have nothing to do with it because I'm when you sometimes you get in places where you realize your inability to do the right thing to even want the right thing and then you have to hide in christ and say god help me have mercy on me a sinner because if it depends on me it's not going to happen you know and uh yeah yeah and, and, and i yeah and, and i don't use that as an excuse for lack of attention to my inner life but and maybe i do but um <laughs> i've been on the other side and i'd rather defend uh, the free salvation than my uh, ability to fulfill, you know, things just because I know about them here, but the time and with God and with the truth hasn't really transformed me yet. And there, I mean, there's a partnership there. Sometimes I have to do things before I'm fully ready to do them, but you know, there's a cooperation with what God is doing on definitely. But I think the initiation, I rely more on God and the other things that I think maybe should be fixed. I don't fix them anymore. It, well, I, I, Unless I, my wife really pushes it, then I try to work on it. <laughs> The, the thing I think I, I would, I feel like we've said this in so many words, but I want to say it maybe a little bit in a, in a tighter format, which is that we are saved 
by a sincere confession of faith, full stop. But that confession of faith, if it's sincere, is going to produce good works. And I think we can use those, uh, those good works as evidence that we can have assurance. So anyway, but not, not, not those good works alone. <laughs> yeah. Question at left field. Okay. Love those. How important is time? Like the, uh, the, the timeline, uh, cause earlier, like way earlier, you're talking about like, if you're saved at one point and then you stop doing good works or you stop being saved or whatever, and then you like, is your salvation determined on your state of being saved when you die? Or is it determined by your state of being saved at some point during your existence? Because if there is a God, does God really care about our mortal timeline? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah it so, is a great question. Yeah, I think that depends if you hold to an A or B theory of time. <laughs> um, no, if you're a Christian, you have to hold to an A theory. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm sort of kidding. But, uh, What's the A and B theory of time? Oh, that's really fun stuff. So the, the, the B theory of time is that time is not... So, okay, so let's say this. A theory of time is how we normally think about time, if, if nobody explains, um, um, you know, Stephen Hawking to us, which is um, right. that basically at any moment that we're... The, the, basically, the present moment is all that exists. The, the past us doesn't exist any longer. It once did, but no longer does. The future okay. us uh, will exist at some point, but it does not yet exist. That's the A theory of time. So all we have is this moment. Now, the B theory of time is that time is spatial, essentially. So and that, all moments exist right now, but we're just in this moment. Yes. Okay. So th this is me right now, but me in the past and me in the future exist simultaneously, so to speak, um, but in, in a non-tensed way. <laughs> right. So, so to give an example, I don't know if you guys remember the comedian Sam Kennison. Sam Kennison grew up Pentecostal, but he was a very irreverent comedian. Um, I mean, really irreverent, you know, telling jokes about talking to Jesus at the urinal, for instance. And that's the, just the nice way of saying it. Uh, he died and he was a very uh, robust sinner and not a Christian, but he grew up Christian. And at the end of his life, he was in a car accident. And there are apocryphal um, stories about him just talking to Jesus and repenting at his death, you know, just like there is of every other crazy unbeliever, Darwin, whoever else. Uh, but anyway, so the, the question becomes then, you know, did he have to make that final return to be saved? Or was he already just going to be saved, but just had no, not much reward on the other side or, or whatever the consequences of his period of unbelief got for him? You know, I don't know. That's the question. Did he have to do that last minute repentance to actually secure his, his uh, salvation? Or was it just, you know, perfunctory or something? Right. It's, it seems to me that perseverance to the end is, is a scriptural notion. <clears throat> um, yeah. That being said, because I'm um, very wary about uh, sitting on God's throne and making judgments about when someone has saved and when someone has lost, um, I don't feel comfortable making those determinations. And, and I certainly don't think it happens, you know, you commit one sin and then you have to get back on the horse and, you know, you're off. You know what I mean? Like you're, 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 you're done for now until you repent again. I don't well, think it works that way. A related question is, if you are a Christian or you have the knowledge of Christianity and you're far away, should you be very uncomfortable about that as being in a precarious place? Mm -hmm. And I think as a Christian, I would say, well, yes, you should be. But as a person who walked through unbelief um, for a period of unbelief, I would look at it differently. I would say personally that God was interested in me being genuine, that my confession of belief when I didn't believe in my heart was only fooling me and the people around me, but it wasn't fooling God. And I felt like God led me out of where I was but to be, to have integrity and to say, confess what you actually believe. And if you don't believe, confessing that you believe does nothing. Um, and that was my, so my assurance during that period was that God, if God was real, he would reveal himself to me. He would save me because I can't save myself. And in the meantime, I'm just going to be honest about where I am. And I, I think that was a smart decision because my a lack of integrity and honesty about where I was would have just perpetuated this kind of 
weird self-deception and around and it wasn't keep i was not moving forward i was actually stuck in my unbelief until i was able to pursue it uh it's kind of like the story of the prodigal son right and the son who stayed home out of religious duty you know i mean was the could the, could the prodigal son have died out there in the pig pen yeah he could have that's the tough part of that story but he didn't and so i heard once heard somebody say you know of the two sons which one loved his father more the one who stayed out of respect and obedience but had unbelief and grumbling in his heart or the one who said dad this is who i am i gotta go see ya now that doesn't mean god was happy with his profligate life but there's something hidden in that story about integrity and god's ability to draw us uh back as part of perseverance i guess is what i'm saying well and I, I had, you know, myself a quick deconversion when I was pretty young and then a slow reconversion. And um, if, if I, if I want to trip myself out sometimes, I can stop and, and think, okay, if I would have died at this point on my journey to reconversion, would I have been saved? Or, or what about this point? What about this point? And I guess the way that I tend to think of it is, um, I mean, I, I think that God was working on me, and I think he, he obviously knows where everything's going in the end. That question of divine foreknowledge and our choices is a complicated one um, to parse, but um, it seems to me that at the very least, um, when I was oriented toward God, even though I had traveled very far away, that turning, you know, the prodigal son on the way home, um, you know, I, I, it, it's not necessarily the getting home that was important. I think it was turning to, to journey back home that was important that was the significant action and so I, that's how i guess i would look at it. it doesn't necessarily matter how far along you are in the journey it matters that you're walking in that in the right direction <laughs> um now as for whether or not um which moment in time god uh, <laughs> um, god saves us uh that's kind of complicated because i guess if you hold the b theory of time are we the same object throughout time or are we a different object at different points there, there's a, 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 a there was a muslim um uh philosopher who d developed this concept of occasionalism that um god had to recreate the universe from moment to moment moment so it wasn't just sustaining a creation that he'd created but he was constantly having to bring it into existence so that every moment was like a new universe <laughs> And it seems to me that it becomes very difficult at that point. It's like, a, like it was the ship of uh, Theseus that, um, you know, what, is it the same ship or not? Um, so I don't know. The Bible seems to talk about persevering to the end. So that seems like a good answer for me. But um, these tough philosophical questions about what time is, uh, I don't know. It's fun. No, but that, that, that's a really excellent question, though. I mean, if you believe in some sort of eternal security, you definitely have to answer the question about what happens in that interim where you're walking away. Do you have to be reoriented back towards God or, or are you really now Charles Stanley took a stand on that. And that's interesting. So maybe the answer for those who have a B theory of time is that you have to either be a Calvinist or a Stanleyist. <laughs> you can't be an Arminian. Now I'm going to have to search the internet to see how much of a Calvinist Charles Stanley is. Thank you for giving me something to do. Hey, no problem. I, so I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. I know there are some Calvinist Baptists, but mostly they're kind of suspicious about Calvinists. That's changing a little bit in some circles. Um, but I've got a book by a professor of mine named, oh, actually Aaron might have met him possibly, Dr. Mark Bird. Oh, yeah. I used to attend his uh, philosophy discussion groups. Yeah. So he has a book. He, book. He, yeah, he's, he's, he's a fun guy. But he has a book where he interacts with uh, Charles Stanley's stuff. And I think it's called How Can I Be Sure? And it's like a kind of an assurance discussion. But anyway. Cool. Well, any any concluding or parting, parting shots? <laughs> uh, I feel like this was probably already answered, but I'm going to ask it again anyway. So if the A theory of time exists, does that put limitations on God? Like if the past and the future don't exist, only the present. Does that mean God cannot access the past and future? Um, so, or a, I mean, maybe it's like Daniel said: it says each time is its own creation. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you're muted, man. I can't. I can't tell what you're saying. Don't blame that on me. That's all, Cody. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm a, I'm a strict a, a theory of time guy, so. Okay. No, I think God sits outside of time, and because of his foreknowledge, 
he has seen everything that will happen. So I think there's this weird sense in which nothing in the past or future surprises God. Yeah. But to yeah, say that he can't go back and change the past, that may be true in some sense. Um, I, uh, that, that's like what we were taught in religion class at St. Bernadette. Like God, God is eternal and kind of exists outside of time. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's a philosopher, a Christian philosopher named William Lane Craig, who has a book on time. Um, and I think he actually does make the argument that God, um, once he creates, chooses to um, maybe not entirely limit himself. I think he would still say, see God as some, somewhat outside of time by nature. Uh, but he argues that God basically comes into time. And so that God is moving along with us in this trajectory. And I'm pretty sure he holds to the A theory. Um, and he's a Molinist also. He is a Molinist. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's, yeah, we're talking a lot of theological terms. So Molinists right. are people who tried to balance out Calvinism's foreordination, predeterminism stuff with Arminius's um, man's choice. You, know, you want me to explain it pretty briefly? Yeah, if you want to, yeah. Sure. So, you know, Calvinism emphasizes uh, man's inability to save himself and God's predestination that God chooses. Mm -hmm. And he gives you an irresistible grace. When he calls you, you can't say no. That's kind of how they look at it. The Arminians say, well, no, that absolves man of responsibility. It also makes God responsible for evil because if he determines what everyone's choices are, then he's ultimately the one that's responsible. So they emphasize f free will, that, we, that God maybe gives us the grace at a certain period in a certain window to repent, but we have the choice to say no. And so the Molinists would say, well, we don't agree with either one of you. What we say is God doesn't pre God is in control of everything, but he doesn't predestine you to make your choices. What he does do is knowing how you would react in every possible situation. He has constructed a world in which he has organized your circumstances and you are still freely choosing within those circumstances. Even though he knows how you're going to choose, he's not forcing you to choose. So there, in that sense, God is still in sovereign control of what happens but he, you are still responsible for freely choosing because in that situation, he knows how you would freely choose. So he's not directly uh, determining your choice. Uh, that's, I think, one way to, I mean, Molinism is complicated, but that's how I understand it. Well, it's kind of based on this idea of middle knowledge and counterfactuals. If I do this, then this will happen. Right. And so, uh, yeah, so basically God looks down the corridors of time and tries to basically actualize the timeline that he finds to be the most beneficial but that's still based on our choices. So he, so he, anyway, there's all these possibilities based on what we might do in certain circumstances. He actualizes the one that he sees as the best. Right. So that would be a type of libertarian free will within a sovereignly controlled context, as opposed to going one way or the other, where God doesn't know what you're going to choose or, you know, or on the other hand, where he controls every choice, which is the, it's appeal to me, by the way, but there's a lot in Calvinism, I think, to be admired as far as, our reliance upon God compared to our reliance on ourselves, which I like. But, but I think that the idea that God knows what's going to happen, um, the, the question of whether um, on an A theory of time, he can't change the past or future. I presume that he would create the world knowing what he needs right. to do at whatever point, And <laughs> if he needs to intercede or if he just needs to begin a world along a certain trajectory. Um, so I, I don't think that whether it's an A theory or a B theory, God necessarily needs to go, oh, wait, I forgot to do this. Uh, well, shoot, I missed it. Um, but I, don't, I don't see that happening necessarily. So, so, I mean, theoretically, an omnipotent, omniscient God would not have to do that, right? <laughs> yeah. But he could if he wanted to, right? Yeah. If God wanted to forget, he certainly could. And actually, yeah, well, yeah, he does that with the, in the incarnation and in, in the Son, right? The, the, every, um, no one knows the, the day or the hour of the end apart from the Father, not even the Son. Mm. So when he takes on humanity, he actually does choose to limit his knowledge. Yeah, in fact, we were just studying omniscience in uh, my systematic theology class, and the way Grudem puts it is, uh, you, you've heard the thing, can God make a rock so big he can't move it? Well, not only is that a logical fallacy in general, he basically says, no, there are certain things God cannot do because his nature precludes those actions. Mm -hmm. So when you say God's omnipotent, but he can't do something, that doesn't mean he's not omnipotent. It means that that's not within his nature to do evil, for instance. And that's not saying that God's not all powerful. It's just that it's the limits of goodness yeah. that make it so. 
I, I think in our philosophical philosophical tradition, at the very least, we would say God can't do what's immoral and he can't do what's illogical. And that is not to say that God is not, therefore not omnipotent. To say he can't do something is not limiting his omnipotence. It's a different kind of limitation than one of power, maybe. Where'd that logical framework come from? Presumably from, from himself, uh, or at least his mind, right? Well, so if, if, God, if God is an eternal mind, a mind is organized along certain pathways, right? So assuming that God is not a completely irrational being, he would have to have a rational mind. So maybe rationality is just how God's mind works. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think because uh, irrationality would be falsehood. So if you say God can only be true, yeah. and I would say irrationality can stem out of that too, that's just truth or falsehood. So something that is irrational is false. Ergo, God could not be irrational or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I can see the wheels turning wanna, in there, man. I want to emphasize that I'm not like trying to trip anyone up or anything. I'm just like I was, questions that naturally flows through my brain. I'm totally. Just, Those are great questions because Christians need to know how to answer real philosophical objections and not just say, I don't know. You know, that's not yeah. right. I don't want to speak for Daniel. I am perfectly I comfortable with the answer. I don't know. Like that—that yeah. that is a perfectly valid answer, as far as I'm concerned. It can be, as long as you don't default to it <laughs> too early. <laughs> sure. I, don't I mean, I don't know now, but to say it's not knowable is—is is, you know an appeal to mystery. I, I don't. That's not my favorite response. Right. Well, I think there's a difference between saying I don't know versus something is unknowable. Like. Yeah. So I like, was conflating those accidentally fair enough well, and, and, and so i haven't talked a lot about it but but um I, i've always wanted to do a um, podcast discussion of bill and ted's excellent adventure excellent. because in my mind it's it's so people always talk about back to the future as a time travel movie um but bill and ted's excellent adventure is actually philosophically coherent and back to the future is not oh stop you cannot say that about my favorite series back to the future <laughs> I mean, it might be it might be fun but it's just it's not it's incoherent so but but if you, you watch Bill and Ted, and also it's another thing, uh, talking about the B theory of time, all time travel uh, notions, I think, assume a B theory. Because if you want to get to a certain point, it has to exist. <laughs> and so yeah. there's this great bit in, uh, well, if, if you watch Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, it starts with his dad, Bill's, is Bill or one of them's dad, who's a, a sheriff, who's looking for his keys one morning before he goes to work and he can't find the keys. So later on in the movie, Bill and Ted are arrested and thrown in a jail cell and they can't figure out, you know, okay, well, this is going to ruin our whole plan. How do we get out of this? And whoever, let's say it was Bill. Bill says, well, I have an idea. I will go back in time after we get out of here and I will steal my dad's keys and I will bring them here and I'll put them over here in the corner of this jail cell hidden under this bunk. And he goes, okay. And so Ted's like, oh, okay. So Bill goes over looks in the corner, finds the keys, unlocks the jail cell, gets out. So you cash all the keys, remember to put the keys, go back in time and steal the keys. Wow. <laughs> so he already had done it. That's funny. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> but um, I mean, it seems paradoxical, but it's, I mean, it actually works logically if you think about it. Whereas like Back to the Future where he's watching the picture, the, the, the family members disappear from the picture just makes no sense. You know, there was some time travel movie I saw recently and I can't remember who it was. It might have starred um, Leonardo DiCaprio where in the end he's chasing himself um, through time. Oh, I can't remember what it was. I'll, I'll go look for it. Okay. Anyway, that's... A, Another great time I, travel movie I, is Primer if you've never seen that one. No, I have not seen Primer. I Primer. love time travel movies. I've seen a lot of them. Uh, time Primer's paradox good. movies are great. Primer's kind of like a low-budget indie, but it feels very, like, scientific. They, they, they're very careful about thinking through the logic of it and how it it's works. Not like, is it like Donnie Darko or some of those other strange no, films? It's, no, not, it's not, like, weird quite in that way. But it, it's, it's really good, though. It's really good. Primer. Anyway. Chuck, are you still with us? <laughs> he is. He's connected. He's looking for the unmute button. <laughs> or the video button. That's right. Yeah, I'm actually working, uh, so I'm trying oh. to do my work at the same time. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you for jumping in, Chuck. I, I, I feel like we've probably, well, I know we, we ventured off the territory a little bit, but it was a lot of fun. Um, I think we've probably reached a good conclusion, isn't it? unless anybody wants to say anything to finalize it. Well, thanks for including me. I'm not as well studied as the rest of you guys, but uh, I'm just your basic uh, Christian, but thank you. Thank Appreciate you, it. Appreciate you being here. Yeah. Awesome. Daniel, Chuck, Aaron, thank you. 
And uh, I'm going to hit the end record button. And Now we can talk about movies. <laughs> <laughs>